coming to the neurological examination, the first thing that we look is mental status, that is higher mental function. Obviously, you can't do everything that is usually dictated in higher mental function, but yes, you can definitely look at alertness. In this video, you can see that the child is alert, he's smiling, he's looking at you, he has a good reasonable interest in the surrounding, he's, you know, tracking what is happening, what is not happening. He is able to, you know, obey simple commands. So, at least describe your mental status in terms of alertness, interest in the surrounding, whether the child has a visual tracking or not. Is the child able to obey simple commands or not? So, at least try your level best to depict these simple mental status examination. When it comes to cranial nerve examination, most of the time you have a very limited window. But three or four things that I don't want you to miss when you are presenting your cranial examination is visual acuity. So look at the child, whether the child is able to fix and follow, right? Whether the visual acuity is preserved or not preserved. Is there any squint? Do not forget squint in children with cerebral palsy. Do not forget about hearing impairment. You give a ring, ringing bell and you see whether the child is, you know, responding to the hearing response or not. Do not forget about oromotor dyskinesia when you are describing 9th, 10th cranial nerve. So, these are four things that I don't want all of you to miss when you are presenting the cranial nerve examination. So, keep these four points in your mind. I don't want you to miss vision abnormality, hearing abnormality, squint abnormality and any dyskinetic movements which are there around the mouth, right? So, do not forget these four important points. Then, once we move from higher mental function, cranial nerve, the next thing that we usually do is motor system examination. Here, the first thing you can notice, you know that in a non-ambulatory child, I am supposed to comment on the posture. One thing that you can very obviously notice in this video is that the child has, you know, hyperextended great toe. And you can notice that the child has some amount of, you know, tightness which is very evident and dyskinetic movements, right, across the upper limb. So, this is a child with dyskinetic cerebral palsy and what you are noticing in the toe is what is called as triatal toe which again indicates that there is an extra pyramidal tract involvement. Similarly, in this video, you can notice that this baby has abnormal tight posturing of the entire body with the twisting of the entire body resulting in arching of the back. So, this is again an indicator of generalized dystonia. So, please do not forget extrapyramidal syndromes, extrapyramidal signs when you are examining children with cerebral palsy. Two important points that I want to uh, emphasize when you are assessing the tone of that particular child. Remember that there is a difference between spasticity, rigidity and dystonia. Remember, dystonia is a, not a tone abnormality. It is an abnormal body movement, right? Tone abnormality could be spasticity or it could be rigidity. That means if you are feeling that the child is tight, right, and you do it very, very slowly, you are able to feel the tightness whole across the movement, both in flexion as well as in extension. Then you know this is rigidity. But when you try to do flexion, you see when you do it very, very slow, you don't feel the resistance. But when you do it very fast, you see a catch followed by a release. This is indicative of spasticity, right? So, tone abnormality could be spasticity or rigidity. Rigidity indicates extra pyramidal involvement. Spasticity indicates pyramidal tract involvement, right? Dystonia is what you saw in the previous video. That's just an abnormal body movement. That means, if you see this baby when the child is tight, the tone will look increased. But the moment the baby sleeps down, the tone will start decreasing. So, the tone is variable in dystonia. Right? I am repeating, dystonia is not a tone abnormality. It is an abnormal body movement. It is an extra pyramidal movement. Right? It is a movement disorder. It has got nothing to do with tone. Only because it says tonia, it does not mean tone abnormality. So, dystonia is better seen. 
right? If you have spasticity, you can feel the catch followed by the release. Deep tendon reflexes are usually brisk, right? Clonus can be present. Pathological reflexes are usually present in spasticity, right? So, please note to differentiate spasticity from dystonia. Remember, many of the children with cerebral palsy will have mixed signs of spasticity and dystonia. That means the child might have abnormal body movement, but in addition, you might feel that there is a catch followed by a release. The DTRs might be brisk. So, this indicates that there is a mixed cerebral palsy and not pure spastic or pure dystonic cerebral palsy. Remember that in dystonic cerebral palsy children, DTRs are rather difficult to elicit. When the child is tight, you keep trying DTRs, you can't elicit DTR. Right? But if the child is sleeping, you elicit DTR, the DTR may be totally normal. Right? So, it is very important to differentiate spastic cerebral palsy from dystonic cerebral palsy from mixed cerebral palsy. So, these are three group of problems. And in clinical practice, we usually encounter more of mixed cerebral palsy rather than pure spastic or pure dystonic kind of cerebral palsy. So, how do you rate and how do you do the tone assessment? Tone assessment is usually told in terms of modified Ashworth scaling. Modified Ashworth scaling is depending upon how much of tone is increased, whether there is no increase or whether there is a slight increase or there is a more marked increase throughout the range. So, depending upon that, you are going to mark it as Ashworth grade 3, grade 4, grade uh, 5 or whether it is grade 0. So, you can use Ashworth scaling, but the other scale to do tone assessment is usually Tardio scale, which is far more sensitive. It will all it because it includes both velocity as well as the quality of the muscle reaction. So, it not only looks at the resistance degree or extent of the resistance, it also looks at what velocity you you know did the resistance. I just I just told you that spasticity is velocity dependent. You do it slow, you do not get resistance. You do fast, you see a catch followed by a release. So, remember that Tardew is much better useful than Ashworth, but Ashworth is much easier and it is perfectly acceptable to use Ashworth stage, staging. So, while you are mentioning the motor system examination, please do not forget three or four important points. Many times I find that, you know, students miss these extra pyramidal movements, do not miss choreathetoid movements, do not miss dystonias, do not miss contractures, right? This is a very, very important point in children with cerebral palsy, do not miss contractures. Remember that DTRs can be difficult to elicit during the dystonia. Only because DTRs are absent, don't call it as peripheral neuropathy. I have seen many students trying to justify absence of DTR in a child with cerebral palsy always means that there is a peripheral neuropathy. So, for God's sake, don't, you know, come to such kind of conclusions like DTRs can be difficult to elicit, especially if there is a contracture or if there is a dystonia. So, just to take care of this point. Right. Another important thing that I which I have already emphasized is that most of the time the tone is often variable in dystonia. That means when you examine the tone, when the child is tight, it might look tight, it might look high, but when the child is sleeping, it might look totally loose. So, tone is often variable in children with the dystonia. So, as in this video, you can see that the child is ambulatory, but again the child, you are able to see that there is abnormal twisting movements and the child is trying to, you know, have twisting movements and trying to walk. So, this twisting movement is there both in the upper limb as well as in the lower limb. So, just to take care not to miss these extra pyramidal movement disorders because if you miss this extra pyramidal movement disorder, you your entire case might get wrong, right? Many of your findings might go wrong. So, do not miss on these findings. Some of the key points that I wanted all students to remember when it comes to cerebral palsy is that remember that most of the time, Biarticular muscles are affected. Biarticular muscles basically means those muscles which are crossing two joints like iliopsoas, hamstring group of muscle which is crossing hip as well as the knee joint, gastronemius muscle because it is crossing knee joint and ankle joint. So, these are the group of muscles which are very commonly affected. Most of the time cerebral palsy 
is not and not only about increased tone. The muscles are also very weak. Right? There is a loss of selective motor control. What does that mean? Selective motor control. Suppose I want to lift this pen. I have to flex my elbow and my elbow extensors have to relax. Then only I will be able to fix pick up that pen. Imagine a situation in which my both biceps and triceps are co-contracting. Pronators, supinators are co-contracting. Flexors, extensors are co-contracting. So what will happen? My hand will get twisted. Will I be able to pick up the pen? I will not be able to pick up the pen. Right? So this is what is called selective loss of motor control in which when an agonist is supposed to do, antagonist is not supposed to do. But if agonist, antagonist are co-contracting, this is loss of selective motor control, which is often seen in children with cerebral palsy. Remember that primitive reflexes usually persist like Moro's reflex, like ATNR, they might persist. So as in dyskinetic cerebral palsy, you will see that many of the time the ATNR that is asymmetric tonic neck reflex is persisting and the child is still unable to turn from one side to another side. And advanced postural reflexes which were supposed to appear have not appeared which are impaired. Right. So the four problems that are very common in cerebral palsy is that tone is increased, muscles are also weak. There is a loss of selective motor control and primitive...